You're listening to CX Confessions, brought to you by Koros. In each episode, we'll share the customer experience stories and insights you need, straight from the sharpest minds in CX, to better connect with your customers and create customers for life. Let's start the show. Hello, hello everyone, and welcome back to CX Confessions. We are so excited to have another great conversation. I'm Catherine Calvert, CMO of Coros, and joined as always by my magnificent co-host, Spike Jones, GM of our Strat Services business. Hello. Um, Spike, we have, a, we have an amazing guest today that I cannot wait to talk to and share um, her stories with our audience. So, who do we have here? I am so excited and privileged to introduce Aaron Lowenberg. Now, Aaron is um, a legendary, I would say, merchant in the retail industry. She's worked with many of the biggest brands. Um, she's being bashful, if you could see her right now, um, but it is true. Gap, Patagonia. She has spent the last six years building one of the hottest brands in retail. If you don't know or aren't wearing Rothy's, you should be. Um, Rothy's is. Uh, it, well, it started as a shoe company. It's much more than that, um, but it started as a uh, as a brand committed to sustainable fashion and accessories. And they figured out how to craft a high fashion, super accessible shoe out of plastic bottles. Over a hundred million plastic bottles, Spike, have been saved and repurposed and created and reimagined as um, as beautiful footwear and accessories. Erin uh, is one of the um, visionaries behind that whole story. She's been there for almost six years since the beginning. She is the senior vice president of merchandising and product for Rothy's. Erin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Catherine. I'm so honored to be included in this conversation, and it's great to meet you, Spike. It's good to see you both. Well, I am. Uh, I'm wearing Rothy's right now. I'm wearing the um, sneaker. It's a Friday, casual Friday, in my home office. Um, and so I'm a longtime fan. I'm I'm from San Francisco. It's a San Francisco story. Um, but I, you know, I love beautiful things. I know you do too. It's hard to create a uh, to bring a new brand to market, um, and that and to create such um, adoration. Um, and then to do it in a way that is actually like has an impact on the world. You guys, uh, congratulations! Recently named one of the most influential companies in cool. 2021 Very by cool. Time Magazine. That's not retail company. That's all companies. What is it that is so different about Rothy's? Wow, um, I would say what's different about Rothy's is that it was it's. It didn't start as a company with um, a branding exercise, or it started with the, the earnest desire to do something better with product in the world. It has always been a very happy brand. It has always been a very optimistic brand. And it's been a brand from the very beginning that's been considered sustainable. And it was back before sustainability was table stakes, cost of entry, everyone needed that version. We, we just wanted to do things a little differently. Um, and the brand itself is, is emotional. And there's some fashion and some fun, um, and I feel like it's very accessible. They're comfortable shoes, flat shoes, they're versatile, they're soft, they're colorful, they can change your outfit, and they'll take you through your entire day. So they could sit at the front of the closet for you and sit at your front door and they're, oh, by the way, made out of recycled water bottles and oh, by the way, machine washable, which footwear has ne never been. So um, I think that's, we had some beautiful timing, had some tailwinds. We had a consumer who thought we had a great idea and we haven't looked back. I mean, in all the things that you've mentioned, I mean, it makes your brand so talkable and the word of mouth just travels and travels and travels. And so, you know, one of the things that I love about this brand is the true sense of community and people even making their own communities uh, on Facebook and out there into the world because uh, they want to gather like-minded people together. And it's really a cool thing to see such uh, authenticity when it comes to, the, to those communities and the people that join them and, and carry them on. So 
with that in mind, like when did this, when did that idea or when did this, this, this idea, not idea, but when did the community start to scale? And when did you really know that you had something that was really special? Um, wow. So community started to scale. I'm going to say it started in 2016 as, as really was our first year of being truly in business for a year. It was very much a year of growth and learning and in our own design um, and product point of view, we were still in tiptoe mode a little. And I remember one of the first moments was seeing somebody, I'm from San Francisco, I live in San Francisco, seeing somebody I didn't know wearing our shoes. And I was like, whoa, what is that? I mean, that, that was <laughs> like that hearing was your song on the radio. That's right. Um, and so I remember that moment to me striking me and having come from really big brands you know, the products had always been sort of massive and international when I was working there. So it was not, it was a moment I'd had not felt. So I was like, that's exciting. And then by 17, 2017, we took all of our manufacturing vertical, we opened our own factory and we really started driving the process with the product. We could, we could hear what the customer was saying, but we could produce more effectively and more broadly. Our aperture opened a little bit, we had more assortment and this incredible organic process of Facebooks and Instagrams and every platform that I can think of, customers and, and the community was kind of building on its own. And I, I didn't know about it. I didn't know much about that. And I, I think that at one point, customer service on our team might have gotten an email, like an old fashioned email from someone <laughs> referencing um, a group of Rocky's addicts. And I was thinking, what is, what is that? And I, I, <laughs> I, so I started the, the journey that day of seeing how many people talk to each other about our product. And I've never seen anything like it. And um, these groups have continued to grow and they're, they're positive in that they're, I think these, these groups are built with customers who really love to talk about the product and the versatility of it, or they're in search of things, or should they wear this with that? And it's, it's really beautiful to see. It's beautiful to see the range of, uh, of the customer base we're building and, and those who are participating in the dialogue. Um, and it's, it's part of, what I think of when I make product decisions. It's why we're here and we appreciate that. Um, we appreciate these communities and, and how big they are and how broad they are and it's inspiring to me. So um, it's been about two full years of really significant customer-based interaction. It's, it's, it's been at least two, you know, two or three years, but for me it's been, it's not even something I I'm surprised by anymore. It's part of my everyday, you know, who, who, who needs this? Who wants this? What will they think? Um, it helps me every day. And when you think about that, Aaron, I've heard you talk about the gulp rate. I mean, sometimes yeah. it's one thing when you're in the, you know, sort of old store model and you do, you all do have stores, right? Where you're, you're actually yeah. talking to the customer and you can see it on their foot versus this explosion of, um, of virtual communities that Rothy's yeah created organically again the customers created it but it's a lot of feedback how do you take it in how do you think about that you have a vision for your product you want to keep your customers happy how do you how do you keep that conversation alive and um and make them feel heard but maybe you know there might be spots where you want the feedback sometimes you don't um gulp rate is my favorite phrase ever um because there's just so there's just so much you can consume, one can consume, and I think um, the way we the way I look at it is it's important for us to have a have a really strong, clear reason for being a brand and a reason for designing the product, and with that comes lots of opinions and lots of ways to maximize that. But we have a vision and we care a lot about what we're putting into the world and what the colors are and what the styles are and that they're of use or that they will delight. Um, so with a vision, getting lots of feedback is helpful. Um, it's helpful because we have a North star in, in sort of our, what we hope our brand will offer people in the world um, as we grow and scale, hopefully knock on wood. Um, so it, it is hard 
it's easy to knee jerk. It's easy to get in the, it's easy for me to be gone on a, on a chat, just reading something for like an hour. And I look up and I'm like, Oh my, I don't even know what just happened. (laughs) And I, I value that. I value that. And I value and will always appreciate the quote unquote problem of too much feedback. That's the best problem to have. Um, so I think keeping a vision, understanding, of course, we're a business, I'm financially responsible and I have a point of view on what we believe should come next and how we can surprise and delight the customer. And by the way, acquire new ones. Um, having a vision in place is helpful because then the feedback just becomes like it's validating, it's honest information, and it gives me ways to think about things differently that quite frankly, COVID aside, I can't be everywhere all the time. So um, I feel really appreciative of that. And yes, there are times where I just want to, you know, some the feedback is not always nice. It's like, I don't know who's in charge of these colors, but they should be fired. (laughs) And and yet I could say they, there's a, why, what's the, what Mm -hmm. is, what is it that I can learn from that? Um, And anyway, it's all perspective. But right, and you and the having best that thing north star, yeah, yeah, it gives you that filter yeah. through which to yeah. kind of pick and choose. Yeah. Well, and as you already know, feedback is a gift, and even the, the you should be fired for making this, these colors. That's people because they care and they're passionate, they and and yeah. that's mm-hmm. that's yeah. it, like the you know silence would be a totally different thing. But um, you know, and that's the other yeah. part of it. You mentioned it before, but the idea and, and not the idea, but the true concept of community. And you said these people come together and they support one another. And like, that's the true ethos of what community is. And when you, and originally was on the internet too, on social. And now, you know, people just like to go argue, but when people come together, I mean, that's what's, that's why I got into social in the first place too. So it's so cool to see passion brands like yours that still have those folks and say, we, we might not have a lot in common, but we have this one thing in common. Let's come together. Super cool. I know. And I have to tell you guys this story. Um, there, there have been so many moments that keep me grounded and balanced on um, that we're building a community and that it's a caring moment when someone might write to us or share that they went to see a parent who was not well. And this is, again, take the COVID world away. And this is pre COVID. Um, and didn't realize that her parent was as unhealthy as she was when she arrived. And all that her mom at that time wanted to do was just kind of go for a long walk. That's all she was able to do. And this Rothy's customer had only brought one pair of shoes and it was only a pair of Rothy's and she was new to the brand and she put 15 miles on them a day and didn't even think that she would be doing that. And just openly with the most, I mean, for me, the real thing about being a human is that this connection of just saying how appreciative, how appreciative she was, that she was wearing this product that she thought was cute, but it got her through one of her hardest weekends. And she also felt com- they were comfortable for her. They did everything that she wanted them to do. And it's just a shoe. Um, but it made me realize um it just made me realize the value of that kind of feedback and how important mm-hmm. that is for me and for our whole company to, to consider all of our customers and all of their end use and how she took the time to write us that story and, and sent us photos of her mom and we were in tears. Oh. And that's, that is amazing. And mm-hmm. I, I, yeah. I love that. So again, so valuable, uh, passion brands, you know, they don't get like yours, don't get to where they are by following the status quo. So one of my favorite questions is, what is something in your industry, a commonly held belief, if you will, that you passionately disagree with? Oh, goodness. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I I cannot be more in disagreement. (laughs) over manufacturing. I mean, just period, Mm -hmm. just over manufacturing. And, and I say that with so much respect because I've come from a place of big, big brands and attempting to buy the right amount of inventory and anything at the right time is really, really hard to do. And it is why retail is full of markdowns and sales. And there are times where one does need to liquidate or, the passion of a creative idea didn't quite resonate that that's going to happen. 
-hmm. But I, I know the world of hurry up and do something at the cheapest price. And it's not something that our planet can sustain. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to sit in a place of saying, we've got a better way to do it. We do have a better way to do it. We are not saying that ours is the best way to do it, but Mm -hmm. our founders came from a place of there's gotta be a better way to do this. If you need to make a product with that's a shoe and the center of it is actually the hole with which one's foot is put, don't make the upper and cut the hole out and throw it on the floor. Make mm. the upper with a hole in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just sort of a logical design yeah. idea that then led us to knitting and knitting with recycled, with recycled yarn, um, with plastic water bottles that are recycled into a beautiful, soft proprietary yarn. So I, I, I value, um, I value the creativity that it takes to try to do things differently. Mm -hmm. And I'm so disheartened by what retail has had to do that got us to where we are today and that the consumer demands the lowest price and that creates waste, creates, creates pollution, creates over manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So that being vertical as a, as a, passion brand, but being vertical allows us hopefully to continue and will always produce as close as we can in market so that we get that demand as right as possible. Because despite making something from recycled yarns and using recycled materials, if we're just creating something no one wants, our product will end up in landfill. Mm -hmm. So it's that circularity vision that I hope to perpetuate in the world and I hope um, becomes a standard that the consumers and the brands that we all love can just continue to work toward. It's just that had to be Aaron though, like a pretty radical business decision for a fledgling brand to then go say, we're going to take on the expense of creating our own factory. I mean, that's a big leap. Was that it's a big leap that, or for your leader, for you and your, your, Co- you know the founders how did you how did you cross that chasm in terms of near term expense and risk and long term vision i think it goes back to believing in in the the reason mm-hmm. for inception just believing mm-hmm. in the simplicity our product is not um we didn't launch a company to try to be a trend brand we launched a company mm-hmm. to make things that worked really well that held up their their value proposition that added mm-hmm. something to one's arsenal of things you can put on that performed well, but they were made differently. And if you use these tropes as your vision, then doing it well um, and doing it in a simple, cleaner, better way makes the most sense. You know, contract manufacturing is messy and the quality is often questionable and the controlling of the quality that we attempt to provide in our brand um, controlling it, not meaning in a, like a psychotic way, but controlling it to, <laughs> to produce something that people still right. say, like, this doesn't, you know, this still works. It's I've had this product, I'm going to get something else. And it's, it's still that same high quality. And what is really important to protect if you really want to be a brand for the ages. Um, and so, you know, it also allows us to innovate and allows yeah. us to um, continue to protect IP, our um, our brand has a hundred or 200 patents, some pending, but wow. really being able to do something differently is, um, is why we started. It's why our founder started the brand. And so being able to take it in house allows us to innovate, um, do what's right for the customer respond and, um, be as effective as possible from a sustainability and circularity standpoint. And I've heard you talk about that that in, in sort of through the agility lens, right? Like right. to get to other sizes. And so when you think about that customer and your customer and um, and responding to their needs, what's the data? Like, what do you in a in a through the lens of tech or through the lens of demand? How do you? What's the data that you hope for and that you think about as you think about products and? expanding your line or new opportunities for, for the Rothy's vision? Um, I mean, I think the data comes from, 
it's art and science. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's science in that, of course, we, we hear and listen and watch, um, sales. We hear, listen, understand and observe, um, commentary from our communities. I think what's important is to add that to what does a customer maybe not know they need? Mm -hmm. Um, What can we fulfill for them that we feel really passionate about? And how are people's lives changing? How are, how is the world evolving pre and post COVID to need certain things that are either hands-free or, or washable. Um, how do we serve a need that is part of the evolution of, you know, humankind in this world we all live in. And so I, I use, as far as data, I would say, of course, there's competitive research, there's sales and investment strategies and how they pan out. Um, and there's customer behaviors and there's feedback. Um, but I think it's really important to balance that with, are we making something? Are we continuing to produce goods that at the end of the day, we see the future for um, and that we stay true to our, our mission? Um, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Mm-hmm. Just because you can make something really inexpensively and charge a lot for it doesn't mean you should. Um, we want to build things that are lasting. So it's both. It's data. It's left brain, right brain. It's quantitative and qualitative. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's amazing to me that we could have as much quantitative data that might tell us, inform us of of a future decision. But then there's this one color of a bag that just hit because it did. Mm -hmm. It was the right bag at the right time or the right shoe at the right time. And there is no math that would tell you to do that. Um, and so again, it's, it's, it has to always be both, but, um, it's really hard and the world of data makes it better. Um, but sometimes data can be paralyzing. Distracting. So you, you have mm-hmm. to make sure again, back to the comment of like having that, the brand vision, um, in mind all the time and just continuing to take the long view and looking out on the horizon as best as you can so that you stay focused with, again, gulp rate and the amount of data you can use. So speaking of data and learning, so the name of the podcast is CX Confessions. And what I do love about, um, you know, even careers across different industries is we learn from where we might not have made the right choices. So what is a hard lesson that you have learned in this journey of yours? Well, um, the deep sigh. I love oh, it, it's such a deep sigh. <laughs> I mean, personally, I also personally too. I'm like, well, gosh, I per- personally, I, I want, I want a fail conference so marketers can come together and just talk about the times that we screwed up, but what we learned from it and took to the next one to make it better. Mm-hmm. Right. But we don't yeah. marketers, we don't ever mess up. Right. Are you kidding no me? Cameras, no cameras, no recording. No. Just t- yeah. Just yeah, tell us. I mean, I think mm-hmm. I, I would, I would be a fly on the wall in that conference. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, <laughs> I, my, my, I always joke, like, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. We all know that that's a true story. Um, you know, I could designed, I designed a really special shoe for a product launch two years ago and we had just started opening stores. We may have only had one or we may have had two stores. I can't, honestly, brick and mortar, physical stores, physical stores. Can't even remember what day anything occurred, um, mainly probably because it's Friday right now as we're having this conversation. But I did this beautiful shoe, it was a rose quartz point. It was just pretty, a little metallic. It was based on a beautiful draft print. Um, and it was special. And I thought, hey, I love our retail store experience and I want to make sure that they always have this steady flow of some things that you can get by walking down the street and walking in our store. And man, did we piss people off. I mean, we, (laughs) the shoe was so beautiful and it wasn't available to everyone at that moment. It was available to those only on, on our Fillmore street store, I think. And, and I, 
I felt, I felt terrible. I mean, the, the, (laughs) it wasn't even, I wish we could get it and it sold out, but it was like, I love your brand and I live nowhere near that store and I want to participate and you are bumming me out. (laughs) And I was like, Oh my God, I've ruined, I'd like, I'm ruined someone's. Um, I felt it, it, it feels terrible to do things that are special um, because they can feel that they are not inclusive. Mm-hmm. And that is not the intention, but it can land like that. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think it's hard. And I think we try to be very smart about a brand of scarcity, not because we think it's funny, nor because we want to piss people off, but because we don't want to over manufacture. Mm-hmm. So when something is so exciting and emotional and I missed it and I didn't figure out the right depth of that investment, perhaps the, I mean, I just like don't want to get out of bed the next day because the feedback is so, they're so angry that our community Mm. and I, you know, those are the days where I'm like, oh my God, I don't even know what I'm doing. Um, But I get it. And again, these are like, problems to have somebody cared and but Mm -hmm. so you know that's an example or even trying to get into a mask business trying to get into the face covering business in the middle of it right well and not saying time yeah because we wanted to capitalize on it and be really clear it was just that we have a manufacturing facility should we be producing something different that our customer might need and, and, and by the way, March 2020, when March 2020, it seemed like and, the whole world needed masks. Exactly. And, mm-hmm. and in addition, anything and everything we could do to use our supply chain to help um, solve putting things where we could put them because we, we didn't want to sell shoes. We weren't, we didn't want to go market a new thing. We were like, what should, what can we do? And there's no playbook and there's no right way to do any of it other than let's, what, what can we do? One of the cool things we, um, created was this coalition um, that we pulled together a lot of through through all of our networks of of other individuals with different brands, not all Bay Area brands, but national brands that if were there liabilities of things in certain factories in certain places, could we help a brand if they've got elastic by the by the bucket and they're not making their product because of a pandemic? Can we? Can we redeploy that? Can we use that if we help? And so it created this great opportunity for conversation with with other brands who were were sitting in a different place, but also wondering, what can we do? We share patterns. Can we help inform one another? But, you know, again, trying to get to market with a mask, um, you know, a lot of brands were trying to donate. A lot of brands were trying, which there's legal constraints. And we did the best we could. We really did, and and we, the timing of trying to make donations versus put something in our in our arsenal to sell, um, you know, it was a it was a it was stressful. It was, an, it was a call in the moment, and yeah, and, then, and we we we, yeah. we called it out, and we also said, hey, we're going to do the best we can. We're going to we will address this, and our our customer will tell us, our our community will tell us when they need us to hear our, what they feel very strongly about, and we respond. You know, and it, when it's, when it was something that we were, we, we have no problem saying we, we, we've got, we misstepped. Our timing was bad. This idea, we didn't execute it. Or, you know, we, I think as a brand have always been really humble. Um, we've always been appreciative of feedback we get. We've always tried to do the right thing. Um, I fundamentally can put my head down at night and sleep because our efforts are in the right place. And, and when we have to make an apology, when we have to take something and take our lumps, we do. And we're always better for it, always. Um, and we hope that the community always knows that. And you know, we'd love to say there's presumed innocence, but it's okay. And in the heat of stress, a community can come together really quickly and tell you, hey, I need you to listen to us, and we do. Yeah, and we do. And you, and you have, you have. Yeah. Well, I thank mean, you for that. Yeah. yeah. Well, that we, thank you. We got it. two confessions. That is very generous nice. of you. And now as we wrap God, up, Aaron, and send you off. <laughs> so only two Thanks things I've so ever not done well. 
wait, no, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> There's Super the marketer. Not true. There's the marketer. Yep. Uh, Speaking of, we want to get to know you, yep. Aaron Lowenberg. I have the privilege of knowing you. You were amazing. So five quick questions about oh you question. as we yeah. wrap up. Quick confessions. Okay, yes. so no Aaron point. Lowenberg, yes, ready? Uh, yes. Who are you? Ready? Okay, so five questions. What was your first concert? Psychedelic Furs. Oh, nice. <laughs> So cool. cool kid. <laughs> Second question. What was your first job? At my parents' company, which is a tiny company that sold electronics and surveillance. I pretend like I'm in the CIA, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I was in accounts payable. <laughs> in the CIA. Good. Yeah. Good. In the CIA. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. In the, at Cover. the company. I yeah. was 15. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Third question. If you could do something else, if you had to do something else, what profession other than your own would you attempt? Mm. I mean, I always wanted to be a chef. Hmm. There you go. Awesome. Okay. Number four, what's your favorite app on your phone? <sighs> There's so many. I mean, Is it bad to say that like I, I don't I can't deal with my phone? <laughs> no. I mean, no, I, I, it sounds like the the snooze button is your favorite app. It, on the, it's almost like airplane mode. I don't know. Or or <laughs> or it's when I'm like checking in for a flight on whatever airline I'm allowed to be. I I love traveling and I I don't know. I I'm I I have like a pencil and paper and I like write stuff and I don't know. I'm very I'm very analog, but um, I, of course, love every app that makes my life easier, but it's not as if I can't wait to be on one um, as much. I know that <laughs> seems so weird. Am I so weird? Not. Did I just destroy no. the whole no. podcast? No. no. I Airplane just, mode is the best answer we've had. I love right. that. Hey. I love it. I like it. That's okay. cool. So speaking of analog and food and all these things, the last question is, what is Aaron Lowenberg's biggest indulgence? I mean, I would go and spend an egregious amount of money at like buy right to try to make something that nobody even <laughs> wanted me to make. It's, it's a creative thing. I'm a creative person, but like to go mm -hmm. think that I need this specific salt and then I need to go to the, like the architecting of a meal and the excessiveness of it all, like the florals mm -hmm. or a candle or the lighting, because bringing people I love together is such an expression of love for me that it would be overspending on a dinner party. Oh, That's a great answer. That. Great answer. Oh, and I some cocktails. Oh. Yeah, there is. I was like, right. indulge is gin. There's a uh, bourbon. There's, yeah, I mean, guys, uh, I know that. All no right, we'll there's be like there a at full seven. Bar behind me, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> That's, that is like uh, to throw a party and to go over the top. That nobody yeah. knows you did. Mm -hmm. Make All it effortless. Stuff that nobody yeah. knows. Yeah. Is what I would the experience. I would, it is every time. Yeah. Johnny will be like, yeah. what? I'm sorry. You, what is this? And I'm like, it's this knife that I got at March because it's the right size for the small. He's like, I can't. I'll do this. Oh, That's I it. love it. Aaron, thank you. Thank you for telling your story. Thank you for letting us get to know you. And if anybody listening doesn't have a pair of Rothy's, go right now. Amazing <laughs> shoes, amazing story, great company. Amazing. All right, Catherine, everybody. thank you for including me and Spike. Thank, thank you, you for our wonderful conversations today. A pleasure. I appreciate it. Very thank much. you. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for listening in, and we'll see you next time. Hello, I have a very exciting postscript to the episode you just heard. Spike, guess what? 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 Tell me. Tell me, tell me. You won't believe it. Remember how you asked Erin if they had men's a men's line and she was a little bit vague about it and said, maybe, you know, we're talking about it. Yeah, I'm very familiar. Well, they have launched a men's line. Get they have, out. I am not kidding. There's Come a on. loafer and a sneaker. It's got your name all over it. Holy moly. I knew it. From yes. my lips to the creator's ears. Look, that's it. I'm just going to start inventing stuff. So now in my driveway at BMW, I'd like an M14, an M14. That can be a car. 
just it can it, it can happen. could be yeah, yeah. it happen. could be well me i'll uh, i'll send a link to this and we'll see what they say i'm super anyway, excited can, super um, cool congrats to the rothy's team they look amazing and um cannot wait you should all check them out rothys.com and thanks again for listening order yours today <laughs> Your customers expect to be understood. Their likes and dislikes, their history with your brand, and their communication preferences. But so many companies struggle to connect the dots of interaction across their own teams and channels, and it's creating customer experience challenges and disasters. That's where Koros can help. Koros is the award-winning customer engagement platform built to turn those siloed interactions with your customer into enterprise value. Koros works with more than 2,000 of the world's leading brands and powers more than 500 million digital interactions every day. Koros is the award-winning platform for digital-first customer engagement. Ready to create human connection across the digital customer experience to create customers for life? Learn more at Koros.com. Thanks for listening to CX Confessions, brought to you by Koros. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to hit subscribe in your favorite podcast player and give us a rating. See you next time.